Hello and welcome to this session. Today I'm going to be discussing the question, does Allah commit shirk? Shirk is defined in Islam as the unforgivable sin, the unpardonable sin that bars one from entrance into paradise. And in the sin of shirk, it is the act of associating partners with Allah. And these partners are creatures that are placed on the same level or on the same par with Allah. And the Quran warns us that those who commit this grave sin are not permitted entrance into paradise. And so the question then that we want to ask is, does Allah actually commit the very sin that he warns us in the Quran that will bar anyone from entering into paradise? Does he actually commit the sin of associating partners with himself? And so we're going to look at several passages in the Quran and other passages outside of the Quran in other Islamic sources to see if these charges are true. And so uh, I'm just going to share this PowerPoint with you. So the question then that we want to ask is, does Allah commit shirk? Does he commit this unpardonable sin? that Islam warns us against. Well, we need to understand that in the Quran, the Quran charges a number of people with committing this sin called shirk. And so in Surah 9, chapter 9 of the Quran, verses 29 to 31, it states, fight against such of those who have been given the scripture as believe not in Allah, nor the last day, and forbid not that which Allah hath forbidden by his messenger, and follow not the religion of truth until they pay the tribute readily, being brought low. And the Jews say, Ezra is the son of Allah. And the Christians say, the Messiah is the son of Allah. That is their saying with their mouths. They imitate the sayings of those who have disbelieved of old. Allah himself fighteth against them. How perverse are they? They have taken as lords beside Allah their rabbis and their monks, and the Messiah, son of Mary when they were bidden to worship only one God. There is no God save him, be he glorified from all they ascribe as partner unto him. So you'll notice in this passage that the basis for the call to fight against Jews and Christians who are called the people of the scripture or those who've been given the scripture, sometimes called the people of the book, the Ahl al Kitab. The reason why they're told to fight, the Muslims are commanded to fight the Jews and the Christians, is because they do not believe in Allah, nor the last day, and they don't forbid that which Allah has forbidden by his messenger. And they don't follow Islam, which here is called the religion of truth. One of the punishments that are to be leveled against people of the book who don't submit to Islam is to make them pay the tribute readily. And that is what's called the jizya. It's a tax that is imposed upon the dhimmis that is conquered and subjugated peoples. And so Jews and Christians who do not submit to Islam are to be fought and to pay the jizya if they do not convert to Islam. So what is the charge? Why are they called to fight against the people of the scripture? What is the charges leveled against them? The charges leveled against them is found in verse 30. Notice it begins with the Jews, the Quran charges the Jews with calling Ezra the son of Allah, and charges the Christians which, with calling the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Allah. And so both the Jews and the Christians are being accused of committing this sin called shirk by claiming, in the case of the Jews, that Ezra is the son of Allah, and in the case of Christianity, that Jesus is the son of Allah. And as a result of this, You'll notice that the Quran says that this is just a saying of their own mouths. They're just imitating what they've heard in the past. And it calls on Allah to fight against them and that they are perverse for believing this. This agrees with Surah 98, verse 6 of the Quran that says that among the people of the book, those who rejected Muhammad and, and Islam and so forth, in Surah 98, verse 6, it says the Jews and Christians are the worst of creatures, the vilest of creatures for rejecting Islam. The Quran further charges them with taking lords besides Allah, with the Jews taking rabbis, and with the Christians taking their monks. And notice, and taking the Messiah, son of Mary, as Lord. And it goes on to say that they have been forbidden to worship any other god but one. 
there is no God but Allah. And notice it ends with the words, be he glorified from all the ascribe as partner unto him. That is, that Allah is to be glorified from any other rivals, from anyone they dare to associate with them or ascribe to him. So it's clear from this text that the Jews are accused of uh, ascribing Ezra as a partner with Allah, and the Christians are accused of ascribing Jesus as a partner with Allah. Now, let me just point out that in, in, in the case of Judaism, there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever uh, in the Old Testament or in the rabbinic writings that the Jews ever claimed that Ezra was the son of God or that he was the son of Allah. There is no record of this at all. Some Muslim scholars have openly acknowledged this. But the point here is to say that the reason why Jews and Christians are being vilified here and attacked is because both of them claim that certain of their prophets were the son of Allah, in the case of Judaism, Ezra, in the case of Christianity, Jesus. Now the Quran goes on to point out in Surah 5, verse 72, they surely disbelieve who say, lo, Allah is the Messiah, the son of Mary. The Messiah himself said, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Lo, who still ascribeth partners unto Allah, for him, Allah hath forbidden paradise. His abode is the fire. For evildoers, there will be no helpers. And so here in this passage of the Quran, it is referring to those who disbelieve here, in this case, as the Christians, who are allegedly guilty of claiming that Allah is the Messiah, the son of Mary. Now, this is a misrepresentation of Christian belief. Uh, Christians do not believe that God is just a mere man. Uh, that God is just a mere man, the man Jesus, the son of Mary. But what they believe is that God became man in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that the Lord Jesus Christ is both God and man at the same time. The Quran makes it sound here like what we're saying is that God is just a human being, that he is just a human prophet. That's not what we believe. The incarnation that teaches that God became man in the person of Jesus Christ maintains that the Lord Jesus Christ is one person with two natures. And then they claim that Jesus made the statement, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord, and your Lord. Uh, a passage that uh, doesn't seem to find any uh, source in the New Testament itself. The Jews already knew that they were called to worship God and no, no other but God. But notice the warning here. It goes on to say, Whoso ascribes partners unto Allah, for him, Allah, hath forbidden paradise. So this is the sin of shirk being defined in the Quran here, that those who ascribe partners to Allah, uh, they're the ones who are forbidden the paradise. And notice their abode is hellfire. They are hellbound if they commit the sin. And there will be no helpers for such evildoers. So the Quran is very clear that uh, those who commit the sin of shirk are forbidden paradise. It uh, falsely accuses Christians of committing shirk. Uh, Christians do not commit the sin of shirk because we're not associating a human being or a creature with God. Uh, it is not shirk to associate God with God. God being associated with God is not shirk. And so Christians believe that uh, the Son, God the Son, is equal with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And since the Son is fully God and the Father is fully God and the Holy Spirit is fully God, it is not shirk to say that the Son is one with the Father and equal with the Father. Uh, it is sure, it is a sin to assert that a mere human being is equal to God and on the same level with God. That is not what Christianity believes. We believe that uh, Christ is equal to the Father in relation to his deity, and he is like us in his humanity, of course, with the exception of sin. Now, the Quran also points out here several times, at least seven times, it relates a story of Allah creating Adam and then ordering the devil and the angels to bow and prostrate before Adam. This is a story that is not original to the Quran. It existed prior to the Quran. In fact, it comes from um, a pre-Islamic uh, text called The Life of Adam and Eve. And in that story, it recounts this uh, thing about God creating uh, Adam and then telling the angels to bow before him and so forth and so on. So this story in the Quran is not original to the Quran. It actually finds its source outside of it in 
in, a, in a, an apocryphal source. So here Allah says, and he speaks in the plural here, and we said unto the angels, prostrate, sujud yourselves before Adam. They fell prostrate, all save Iblis. He demurred through pride and so became a disbeliever. So notice here in this text, Allah commands the angels to prostrate before Adam. Now the word there is sujud, and this is an important Arabic word. Uh, this is the same word from which we derive the word mosque from, in Arabic, masjid. A masjid is a place of prostration. It's where you prostrate in worship to Allah. And so here, Allah is actually commanding the angels to prostrate themselves before Adam. And here we notice something very alarming. Why does Allah command the angels to prostrate themselves to a man like Adam, and who's believed to be a prophet in Islam, when Muslims today do not prostrate to anyone but Allah himself. So why is Allah commanding the angels to worship a human being who is just a mere mortal? And in a sense, by prostrating to this human being and by prostrating to Allah, you are associating Adam with Allah. And yet Allah says, you can go ahead and prostrate yourselves before Adam. This is a command that Allah ordered. And it says they fell prostrate. All of them save Iblis. Now, who is Iblis? Iblis is the Arabic word for the devil. This word Iblis is not a uniquely Arabic word. It comes from the Greek Diablos. And it entered into Arabic in a shortened or truncated form, Iblis. And so the devil refused to prostrate himself before Adam. It says he demurred through pride and so became a disbeliever. Well, when we actually see why the devil refused to bow and prostrate before Adam, it will actually point us in another direction. So the first problem is Allah says you're not to associate partners with them. And here he is telling the angels to commit an act of prostration, sujud, the same act that Muslims are supposed to render unto Allah. In Surah 7, verses 11 to 18, in that uh, surah, we have another version of the story of the angels prostrating before Adam. And here, Iblis responds to Allah when Allah gives the command to prostrate. You can see that in the second quote there, Allah said, what hindereth thee that thou didst not fall prostrate when I bade thee? So this is Allah telling the devil, why didn't you bow down and prostrate when I told you to? Notice the response that Iblis gives at the top. The devil said, I am better than him, that is Adam, Thou createst me of fire while thou didst create of mud. In other words, you created me from the fire uh, while Adam, him, you created out of mud. Why should I uh, bow down to someone who is my inferior? Now, that's very interesting. Um, for the devil himself seems to know better than Allah here. The devil seems to know that uh, I'm not supposed to give an act of prostration to something that is less than me. And then in Surah 15, verses 28 to 43 of the Quran, uh, Allah again says, this is now another, uh, another version of the same story. He said, o, o Iblis, what aileth thee that thou art not among the prostrate? Why did you not prostrate? And notice the answer that Iblis gives. He, Iblis said, I am not one to prostrate myself unto a mortal whom thou hast created out of potter's clay of black mud altered. Now, this is amazing. The devil now tells Allah that he's not going to prostrate himself to a mortal do, that has been made of potter's clay. Now, notice that the devil here is actually being a better Muslim than Allah. He recognizes that he's not supposed to prostrate to a creature like a mortal who has been made out of potter's clay. And yet here's Allah who tells you not to associate partners with him, telling the devil to do an act of prostration, which is an act of worship, to a creature. So Allah here is the one who is encouraging shirk, whereas Iblis, the devil here, refuses to commit shirk. Who's being the more noble one here? And then it goes on to point out, and remember when thy Lord said unto the angels, lo, I am creating a mortal out of potter's clay, of black mud altered, so when I have made him and have breathed into him of my spirit, do you fall down and prostrate yourselves unto him? And so the angels go ahead and prostrate. The devil refuses and says, why should I prostrate before a creature? Why should I prostrate before someone who's made out of 
uh, clay made out of, out of black mud altered. And so when you really think about it, the devil is actually being a lot more nobler and he's being the real monotheist here. You want to talk about a real Hanif, a, a, a believer in the one God? Well, the devil seems to know that he's not supposed to be worshiping created things, but yet Allah is encouraging him to, to worship created things. Then, of course, in uh, Surah 17, verse 61, uh, the, the devil says again in this version, shall I, Iblis, fall prostrate before that which thou is created of clay? Very good question. Should we prostrate before something that has been created? And so really, when you look at this, once again, I think the devil is actually being much more faithful here than Allah. Now, another issue that we need to consider is the fact that the Quran also points out that Allah prays. And so here in Surah 33, verse 43 uh, and 56 of the Quran, this is from Palmer's English translation, and it says, he it is, referring to Allah, he it is who prays, Yusali, for you, that's Muhammad, and his angels too, to bring you forth out of the darkness into the light, for he is merciful to the believers. Verily God and his angels pray, Yusaluna, for the prophet, O you who believe, pray for him and salute him with a salutation. Now, in other English translations, they try to remove the reference to prayer here and say, and, and replace it with the word uh, blessing. Uh, in other words, it, it is Allah who blesses him, that Allah blesses the prophet and so forth. But the problem here is that, of course, the word for prayer is, um, is um, baraka, is the word to, to bless rather. To bless is, is the word, the verb barak. And um, the word for prayer is the word salat. And here, the word salat appears. It's, it's not the word to bless. And therefore, translations like Palmer and other, others uh, will translate this as who prays, and that Allah prays for the prophet and so forth. So now we have a bit of a, a conundrum now. Allah is praying for Muhammad, and his angels, the angels pray for Muhammad to bring him out of darkness into the light. Now, if Allah is praying then who is Allah praying to? Because when you pray, you pray to someone who is greater and higher than you. And therefore, when one prays, one prays to God, who is greater and who is the supreme being. But if Allah is praying, to whom does Allah pray? To ask that Muhammad come out of the darkness into the light. Well, if Allah is praying, then that implies that there is someone greater than Allah. And therefore, when Muslims say Allah Akbar, that Allah is greater, well, obviously there's someone greater than Allah because Allah is praying for Muhammad. Well, who's he praying to? Is he praying to himself? Why would he pray to himself? That makes no sense at all. And so who is he praying to? And then it goes on to say, verily God and his angels pray, Yusaluna, again from Salat. They pray for the prophet. And who are they praying to? I can understand the angels praying to Allah, but who is Allah praying to? And so if Allah is praying to someone, then that means that Allah is not the greater. That means there is someone beyond Allah for him to address in prayer. Now, the fact that the word here does mean prayer is supported by the fact that in the Islamic sources, the Hadith, for example, like Al-Hadith Al-Qudsiyah, which is believed to be the direct uh, words. The, the, these, are, these are direct revelations from Allah collected in the Hadith. In Hadith 216, it says, the Israelites said to Musa, that's Moses, does your Lord pray? And Musa said, fear Allah, O sons of Israel. Allah said, O Musa, what did your people say? Musa said, O my Lord, you already know. They said, does your Lord pray? Allah said, now listen. Allah said, tell them, my prayer for my servants is that my mercy should precede my anger. If it were not so, I would have destroyed them. So the Israelites asked Moses a legitimate question. Does your Lord pray? Does Allah pray? Moses sidesteps that question and says, fear Allah, O sons of Israel. And then Allah asks Moses, what did your people say? And Moses says, well, you know. Moses can't even bring himself to say it. He says, well, you know what they said. 
They said, does your Lord pray? Allah said, tell them my prayer for my servants is that my mercy should precede my anger. Well, if his prayer for his servants is that his mercy should precede his anger, then who did he pray to? What was Allah's prayer? Who was Allah's prayer directed to? So now we've got a problem here because now Allah is not the greatest conceivable being. The greatest conceivable being would be a being that would have prayer directed at him. Not that he would be praying to someone else. If God is the greatest conceivable being and he needs to pray, then he cannot be the greatest conceivable being because the one he's praying to is now the greatest conceivable being. This is further buttressed by uh, Tafsir ibn Kathir. Now in Tafsir ibn Kathir, ibn Kathir is considered one of the most respected commentators on the Quran in his treatment of Surah 33 verse 56, which we saw. Notice what he says, Ibn Kathir writes, the people of Israel said to Moses, does your Lord pray? His Lord, that is Allah, called him saying, oh Moses, they asked you if your Lord prays. Say to them, yes, I do pray. And my angels pray upon my prophets and my messenger. And Allah then sent down on his messenger, Allah and his angels pray. So when Ibn Kathir gives us the background of that very passage, Ibn Kathir admits and openly admits that this is prayer. This is not calling on Allah to give blessings on Muhammad and so forth, but that this is prayer. And Allah responds in the affirmative that he does pray. And he prays upon his prophets and his messengers. So once again, we need to ask the question, does God pray? And if God is praying, again, the next question is, to who is he praying? And if he is praying, if Allah is praying to someone other than himself, and if Allah is the only creator, according to Islamic theology, and he needs to pray to someone else, then it seems that Allah himself is committing shirk. Because now he's associating partners with himself, associating others with himself. In the other Islamic source, At-Tirmidhi, he records, Abu Umama reported that the Messenger of Allah said, Allah and his angels and the people of the heavens and the earth, even the ants and the rocks and fish pray for blessings on those who teach people good. So notice it's not just now the angels that pray, the people of the heavens and the earth, and even the insects like the ants and their rocks, they pray and the fish in the waters pray, but Allah himself prays. He pr prays for blessings on those who teach people good. Well, who does he have to pray to give blessings to all these creatures. Again, once, or, once again, this brings us back to the question. If Allah has to pray, then there is someone, someone besides him that he prays to. And so what I'm gonna do then folks, I uh, just want to recap what we're saying. Does Allah commit shirk? Does Allah commit to the unpardonable sin? It seems very clear from what we've seen in the Quran that what the Quran accuses others of doing, like Jews and Christians, even though it accuses them incorrectly. It seems that Allah falls into the same trap. Allah commands the angels and Iblis to prostrate themselves before Adam. And the devil is a faithful Muslim, more so than Allah, in the sense that the devil says, why should I prostrate and worship a creature? He's only made of clay. Why should I even do this? He's just a creature. And then we find that not only does Allah encourage Iblis, the devil, to commit an act of shirk by associating Adam with himself by practicing prostration, sujud, but that Allah himself prays. Praise for the prophet. Praise to whom? Well, in the Bible, we never read about God praying. We, need, we never read about God having to pray to anyone because there is no God but him. He is the greatest conceivable being. So I hope that our Muslim friends can see that if your God is the true God, then why does he have to pray? And who does he pray to? Because if he needs to pray, then he is not the ultimate and the true God. And therefore, when you claim Allahu Akbar that Allah is greater, I can show implicitly in the Quran, as I hope I've done in this video, that there is one who is greater than Allah. He's greater. So that 
even he receives the prayers of Allah. Thanks for joining us, and I hope that this video has been instructional and has been a blessing to you. Bye for now.